Even if computers are cleverer than humans, that will not stop humans from doing very silly things collectively. So really, in order to uh, create models that support policy, we will need not just artificial intelligence, but more importantly, artificial sociality. We need brains, but in order to understand what people do collectively, we need to understand also the guts and the sociality. Jan Hofstede is a population biologist and social scientist who does multidisciplinary work in information management, social simulation and the cultural dynamics of human behaviour. The title Artificial Sociality, this is a branch you could say of artificial intelligence. It started in the 90s and then the World Wide Web came around and everybody forgot, forgot about artificial sociality and started to do social media, big data and so on and so forth. Artificial intelligence, meanwhile, has developed to become a very brainy discipline. It's about beating people at chess and go and things like that. And uh, um, computers being cleverer than humans. But even if computers are cleverer than humans, that will not stop humans from doing, from doing very silly things collectively. So really, in order to uh, create models that support policy, we will need not just artificial intelligence, but more importantly, artificial sociality. And then the subtitle, Simulating the Social Mind. This is about creating these simulation models in which you have people running around, meeting uh, and doing all kinds with one another. For example, it could be in a plant or it could be in a city. Um, and these people are not using their brains, they're using their hearts and their guts to live together. I went to Soweto uh, two days ago and uh, what happened in 1976 was a very clear case of, uh, you know, it's not the brain, it's the bodies and the guts and all the emotions that uh, carry the day. Being uh, more clever than a human is not the end all of artificial sociality, uh, and, uh, of artificial, artificial intelligence and certainly not artificial sociality. So this is, I think, point number one. The second one is, this comes about because um, social life cannot be imposed from the top. Instead, it self-organizes. So there is no way that any government or any boss can organize everything that happens in a country or a city or a company. You can organize some things, and you have to. You have to organize the infrastructure, for instance. But then things will self-organize because people are social beings that respond to one another. And this happens in ways that are understandable and predictable, but not yet very well understood, and so cannot be predicted at the moment. Who am I to say what safety culture means? I mean, I don't work at Cecil, I don't work in, uh, in uh, a company, but safety, uh, of course, means that people don't, use their, don't lose their limbs or their lives uh, while they are at work, and probably also don't use their, uh, their calm, they're not traumatized. I would say that probably should be included. Culture, I know about that. Culture is the unwritten rules of the social game. It's the things that um, are not in the books about how to behave. They're not in the 10 golden rules, but they're, they're sort of beneath. For instance, if uh, you have very strict rules about how to behave that are imposed from the top, but nobody at the top actually um, lives according to these rules, then the unwritten rule is hypocrisy. If you're a boss, you can be a hypocrite. So unwritten rules are different from the rules. So culture, uh, on the one hand, the self-organized element and the official rules and the context together will determine what will happen in the organization. Now, risk is an aspect of almost everything that you could do in an organization. And certainly, if it's industry, or such as mining, there is risk almost everywhere. So. Uh, risk is just a very important aspect of the business and the general culture of the organization will be carried over into things they do around risk. For instance, if people are scared to talk to their superiors, they will also be scared when they perceive risky situations. If they're not scared, they will probably be highly motivated to go and tell uh, their superiors about the risky things, which probably will be better for the organization.
many countries, uh, like my own country, the Netherlands, have a pretty old history that they shared together. Uh, uh, the Netherlands came together in the, 17th, or in the 16th century and already many parts have had long common history before that time. So that gives you time to sort of be in the same bath for many generations. That's what creates a common culture. If you have not been in the same bath for many generations, then you're still getting to know one another or refusing to get to know one another, as was the case under apartheid. And uh, so since then, many, many things have happened. I've spent some time in Joburg now, and I can see that um, getting to know one another and more integration while preserving different uh, subcultures of dis different factions is happening. So the special thing about South Africa, to simplify it, it's, it's almost more like an organization than a country. Because an organization is a place where people come together for a purpose, who might not have the same value systems and um, uh, deeper culture. Despite what management books will say about organization culture, organizations do not typically share values. What they need to share is practices and understanding of practices. What does it mean to be late for a meeting? Uh, how important is it to wear protective clothes? That kind of thing is in organization culture. And South Africa is a bit at that level. So you're starting to uh, create more and more common ritual uh, to feel one uh, rainbow nation. But there's a long, long way to go. But I'm confident. Having seen what happens now, uh, a few years ago I was less confident, but it seems to be uh, a long but uh, potentially very promising journey.